Hi everyone, I'm joining the online service this week because I have an exciting announcement to share with you guys. That is, starting next Sunday, that's September 27th, Oikos will be having our first on-site service at BC Christian Academy. For the address, you can Google BCCA School. Uh, it's at 1019 Fernwood Avenue in Port Coquitlam, and our service will be starting at 2 p.m. You can join us in person or live online using our Zoom link. And if you can't join us live, our recorded audio files of the sermon will be made available on our church website as usual. Obviously, this wasn't an easy decision for the church, but because we miss uh, having worship together and having service as a congregation, we've decided to gather every Sunday starting next week at 2 p.m., at BC Christian Academy. If you have any concerns or questions, please reach out to us on our Oikos group chat or to Pastor Daniel. And we hope to see some of you guys out there. And if not, hope you guys are staying safe and healthy. And without further ado, let's start the service by praising God together. Chosen, not forsaken. I am who you 
now pray for the service. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for having us all here gathered, praising you, worshiping you, and learning more of you um, through the sermons and through Pastor Daniel as he guides us to you. Lord God, um, during these insanely unique times in our lives, um, we just pray that you would be with us and listening to these um, messages that you give to us daily and weekly. I just pray that you would help us be inspired to take a step up and go beyond the summit where normally we would not be able to. And um, through this, I just pray that you would strengthen us um, spiritually, uh, physically and emotionally, and that we would always praise you and look up to you for guidance and help. And we yearn for you, Lord God. We pray that these online services and soon-to-be physical services will go well. Uh, it will be socially uh, loving, um, and our community will go and come back together as uh, old Chris was once or before. And um, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, the title of the sermon is, Then Noah Built an Altar to the Lord. And we'll be reading from Genesis 8, verse 13 to 22. Genesis 8, verse 13 to 22. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on the land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Amen. Today, we read about Noah building an altar to the Lord. And this is a very familiar scene for us. Because in the Bible, over and over, we see a man of faith building an altar and worshiping the Lord wherever he goes. So this is what Noah did, this is what Abraham did, and this is what David did. And I believe this is what we do. Just like how our faithful forefathers did, we also worship our God. So every Sunday we worship Him. And we used to gather together, on site, physically together, and we worshiped Him. And even when that became no longer possible for us, worship is what we still do. We worship Him. Although we're not physically together, we still worship Him. So we read the same passage together. We hear the same message together. And we sing the same song together. And we pray together. And we give Him our offerings to worship our God. But of course, our worship service is not the only way for us to worship our God. Because we worship Him not just when we have a service, but we worship Him every day as we live our daily lives. As we walk with our God in our lives, we worship Him by living a life of worship. We 
worship him. But why? Why do we worship him? Why? Have we ever thought about why we worship him? Because some say we worship him because we want to get what we want from him. And some say we worship him because he might punish us if we don't. And some say we worship him because he needs someone to pray his name and to glorify him. But is that why we worship him? As many of us know, people used to think that. That they had to worship God's. For a better life. So throughout the culture, throughout the time, we see people worshiping gods to gain something from them. So when people needed rain for their crops, they worshiped the rain god. And when the people needed a warm sunny day, they worshiped the sun gods. Now, we don't do that anymore though. Because we know there is one and only one God. The God of Israel. The God of the universe. The God who revealed himself through His Son, Jesus Christ. But don't we also sometimes worship our God for a better life? For example, don't we at times all of a sudden realize the importance of our worship when we need His assistance, when we need His help, when we need something? Or perhaps we might worship Him out of fear of punishment. And often, that's what ancient people used to think. They feared that they would get punished by the gods if they don't give them the care and the attention that the gods required. And again, we don't believe in those gods. But even now, sometimes we might habitually worship our God on a Sunday morning because in the back of our mind, we fear that there will be a punishment if we don't worship Him. But if, if that's the reason for our worship, then that makes our God an imperfect and incomplete God. Because if we worship God in order to get what we need from Him, then He is a God who can be manipulated and controlled by us. And if we worship God because He needs our attention and care, then He is a God who cannot stand alone. But our God is neither imperfect nor incomplete God. So we must remember that God did not bring His judgment upon His world with the flood because people did not worship Him. No, He brought the judgment because they lived their lives as if He does not exist. Genesis 6, verse 5 to 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that He had made human beings on the earth. And His heart was deeply troubled. People were not living with the heart of God. But they were living by the wickedness of their desires. And God waited. And He waited. But when they did not turn away from their evil ways... God brought His judgment upon them. It was not because He did not get the worship that He wanted. No, He does not need us to be worshipped. Because if we don't worship Him, then the rocks and the mountains and the heavens and the earth will worship our God. So if our worship is not out of our obligation to satisfy our God, then why do we worship Him? I believe this is a very important question. Because we often worship Him with a wrong intention. And we often worship Him without knowing why we worship. But thanks to the Lord. Praised be our God. Because our God Our living God speaks to us through His written word. And today, I believe the Bible is telling us that we worship our God because our worship is our only right response to our God who loves us. 
So have I told you that your God loves you? If I have, please let me tell you again. Your God loves you. And He wants you to know His love for you because He loves you very, very much. And he, we see His love again in Genesis 8, verse 13 to 19. Because as we can see, after the flood, nothing really in the world had changed. Noah and his family were in the ark, but they haven't done anything active to change the world. And we really don't know anything about what was happening outside the ark. We know that lots of lives were taken away, and we know that our God grieved. But other than that, we don't know very much of what was happening out there, except this. In the Bible, God tells us that nothing in our human mind and nothing in our human behavior had changed. And God knew that. So as we read today, verse 21, God says this, Never again will I curse the ground because of men, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. God said this after the flood because he saw that nothing was changed in us. One of the questions that we often run into when we read the story of the flood is whether there was a, any survivor of the flood outside of the ark or not. And it's a curious thought. It's an interesting question, but the Bible remains silent on this. Instead, this is what the Bible tells us. Before the flood, Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw how, the, how great the wickedness of human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was only evil all the time. And then after the flood, Genesis 8, 22, God says, every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. So we were the same. Before and after the flood, we were the same. But nonetheless, Despite of our remaining sinfulness, God refused to allow us from getting completely destroyed. And that's what we hear from the Bible today. Because what we read today echoes the creation story. In Genesis 1, God created the heaven and the earth. And all the living things in the world. And when he had made everything that he had made, with full of love, God gave them a command, an invitation to be fruitful and multiply in the world that he created, to enjoy and to love the world that he created with him and in him. And although the creation did not respond to the invitation of the creator correctly before and after the flood, we hear our God saying it again in Genesis 8 verse 17. He says, Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you. The birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground. So they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. You see, this is the desire of our God. This is the love of our God. This is our God. We do not deserve His love. We cannot work our ways to gain His love. But He still loves us. So we don't worship our God so that we can live a better life. No, He already wants a better life for us. He already gave us all that we need for a better life. Because a better life for us, the life that He intended, that He planned, and that He gifted us with, comes when we are with Him. When we come to be aware of His love for us. And He wants us to hear His love today. To see His love, to know His love, to believe in His love. That's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us about the love that our God has for us. And the Bible also tells us about a man who came to the place of worship as a response to the love of God. In Genesis 8:20, as Noah came out from the ark, we see that the first thing that he did was to build an altar and sacrifice burnt offerings on it to worship his God. Noah saw the love that God had for him. Noah saw 
how God the Creator was unwilling to let go of His creation. Noah saw how the God who invited and waited for His creation to enter into a loving relationship with Him was still waiting for His creation. Noah, in the ark, he saw that. And as he was coming out from the ark, as he was looking at the world and the lives that God had preserved, he was immersed in his God's unchanging love for him and for the world. So he built an altar to the Lord. That's the first thing he did. He could have searched for a dry land to build a house for his family, to start his life again. He could have called his sons to plan out the hunting and the gathering to get food for the family. He could have searched around for any other survivors or remaining goods of the world. But the very first thing that Noah did was to build an altar and sacrifice burnt offerings to his God. Because, because it was the only right response for him to do when he remembered the love of his God. And as he was sacrificing the burnt offerings, I bet Noah was humbled and humbled by the love of his God. Because it was God who made it possible for him to enter into that place of worship. If God had not saved him from the flood, if God had not pushed the waters away from the land, if God had not closed the door to the ark, if God had not opened that door, and if God had not brought all the clean and all the unclean animals, if God had not done any one of those, Noah would not have been able to worship his God. But there he was at the altar, worshiping his God. And it was all possible because of God. And what we are continued to be amazed as we read the Bible, is that this perfect God, this complete God, this sovereign God is calling His creation to be His partners. Not because He needs help or care or attention, but because He loves. So in the world that He created, He called men and women to be the stewards of His world. And now, at this altar, in the place of worship, God was calling Noah to participate by sacrificing a burnt offering. And burnt offering took a lot of work to get prepared. For a burnt offering, one had to carefully pick the animal, kill the animal, drain its blood, and cut it into pieces. So burnt offering involved an active participation of the worshiper to make atonement. And they were also an expression of commitment. Because the whole animal that was being sacrificed was representing the worshiper's commitment to God, saying, God, I hold nothing back from you. But with all this, there was nothing that Noah was changing. Noah was indeed glorifying God, but Noah did not add any glory to God through his worship. Through his sacrifice, Noah was worshiping God, but he could not have satisfied his God. Because God does not need an animal or anything to be sacrificed for him. The whole world and all that is in it is God's. And God is the God of glory. Glory is who God is. That is his essence. God is full of glory. So Noah's altar and his tiny little offering, it was nothing splendid. It was nothing beautiful. It was nothing magnificent or significant. It was nothing compared to the glory of God. But God accepted it. And not only did He accept it, but He smelled the burnt offering as a pleasing aroma. Genesis 8 verse 21. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. God smelled the pleasing aroma. Because as Noah was worshiping God, God saw what Noah had brought before him. And he saw what was in Noah's heart. He saw why Noah was worshiping him. Noah was worshiping God not out of fear, not to gain anything, but he was worshiping him because he knew that it was the only right response to his God who loves him. And Noah 
expressed his love for God in his worship. In the burnt offering that symbolized his commitment to his God, and his worship became pleasing aroma to God. And I believe that through Noah's burnt offering, God received not just one time's worship, but he received Noah's life. Noah's commitment and his desire to live his life with his God who loves him. And that, that heart of Noah was pleasing to God. And our God, who always gives us more than we can offer Him. Our God, who always responds to our response to His love, responded yet again to Noah's worship. And this always happens when we worship Him. Whether it be our Sunday worship service or our life as a worship, the Lord rejoices when we worship and He responds to us. So the Lord so the Lord meets us in a special way when we worship Him. In the case of Noah, Noah heard the voice of the Lord. He heard God making His promise, saying that He will never destroy this world again. Genesis 8, 21, verse, uh, verse 21 to 22. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in His heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of a human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. When a man, when a mere man, when one man came to worship his God as the only right thing a man should do, the world received this great promise of the providence from their sovereign Lord. My friends, this is worship. When we worship, we hear His everlasting, freshly renewing promise. My friends, we worship Him because it is our only right response to our God. My friends, we worship because we love our God who loves us. So how are you doing, my friends? How is your worship? Are you living a life of worship? Our God, our God wants to draw us near. He wants us to be close to Him, real close, closer than our breath is to us. So let us come close to the worship, to the place of worship, in all that we do, in every step of our lives. Let us worship our God who loves us very, very much. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you're not in need of anything that we can give. But you delight, you rejoice when we worship you with our tiny little offering. So Father, we bring all that we are to you. And we offer our lives to you. And we pray that our offerings, our worship may become a pleasing aroma to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, before we close our worship service, let us respond to the Word of God by praising His name. Let us sing, I offer my life. Pray.
us now close our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>